broken heart cheat Trying to find a way back to the light This is not how she imagined One decision changed the direction Trying to find a way to make it right There's a million people with a broken heart And everyone is looking for change Good morning, Father. Hi, morning, JP. Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Catholics at Home podcast. That was the song uh, Dominoes featuring Father Rob Galea and Ira Losco. That was such a nice song, Father. That was so catchy. Indeed, indeed. And we have the man himself this morning in our show. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. The perfect time to have him. Um, so should we bring him on, Father? Yeah, I think, you know, Father Rob has a, a lot of uh, people who follow him here in Malaysia. 
uh, his music uh, and his ministry, online ministry also. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to have this conversation with him. And, and hopefully this conversation will inspire a lot of us uh, who are, you know, who have had to move online, especially during this lockdown, uh, to encounter God. And, and just like us, who are trying to bring God to people in these conversations, uh, for the wrong and his team also uh, make the op make the effort uh, and to bring Christ to to the world in in many different ways. So I think we share some things in common. So it'd be interesting to have this conversation and also to help us also and others who would like to you know, use these online platforms uh, to continue to to spread the good news uh, to the world and you know to bring Christ to everyone. Yeah, let's bring let's bring Father Rob in. Hi, good morning, hey, morning, good morning, Father Rob. Father Rob. Good morning. It's actually a little little into the afternoon here, so oh, it's, yeah. so great. it's so great to to join you in um, this day. Yes, where we too are also in lockdown. We're in um, an isol in quiet, sort of the same struggles, the same difficulties, but yet at the same time, different parts of the world. How beautiful it is to be able to share this this moment with you. So, Father Rob, you you are you are in just in Melbourne, and you are also having a kind of a lockdown. Are your churches all closed? Also, for, uh, there are no public masses. Yes, so that's right. So most of um, metropolitan Melbourne is in lockdown. Though I work in a parish in regional Victoria, where we're allowed twenty people in our churches right now. So I travel between metropolitan and regional um, at the moment, and so. Um, but where I am now, we are in. We have a curfew. We're locked down. We cannot um, go out unless there's an essential reason to to leave. Yes. So yeah. But we have. I think it is this week. Um, Victoria would have spent. I think it's about 290 days in lockdown since the beginning of the pandemic as well. So um, in and out. Uh, sort of. We're in our sixth lockdown so uh, there are times like for three months we didn't have a lockdown at all um and then um and then it started again well for the rob we, we have gone over 400 days of lockdown so yeah i think we we yes. share a lot of similarities challenges difficulties but i think the wonderful thing is that you know with these online ministries uh, we have been able to reach to a lot more people in, in different ways uh, it, if you it was when we were having a church on site, we were able to only reach people in our locality or within our parish, uh, okay. you know, uh, uh, set setting. But with this online ministry, you were saying just earlier that you have you have Sunday masses, you have you have over ten thousand people. Uh, never would you have imagined that you know you are able to reach so many people, especially use, using online ministries. But before before we get into online ministries, Father Rob, there's a lot of following here, but we would like to get to know Father Rob, the priest. Uh, of course, everybody calls you the singing priest, but <laughs> primarily you and I are a priest. Uh, yes. There's an interesting story, you know. I mean, you you are not Australian. Uh, you you you're from Malta, uh, and you came to Australia and somehow encountered God and and became a chose to become a priest. Father Rob, tell us a little bit of that story, Father Rob. How how did you choose this way of life? Well, look, I, first of all, I didn't always want to be a priest. I'm not one of those people who grew up thinking that they were going to be a priest. I didn't even consider the priesthood until I was like 21 years old. Um, but what uh, happened at the age of um, 12, 13, I had a, um, a bit of a rebellious time where I ran away from home. I'm not going to go through a whole um, sure. uh, story. I actually wrote a book about this, and it, this book is now being made into a Hollywood movie. But this is my, my story is one of desperation where I ended up by the time I was 14 years old, an addict. I'm hanging out with gangs in a place of literal desperation, um, depression, anxiety. At the age of 16, I just wanted to end it all. I didn't want to live anymore. And it uh, was at this moment. And I think this is the way God works. You see, the moment where we reach the end of ourselves, very often that is the opportunity without us knowing that we give God to work. And so I did reach the end of, of where I was, the end of myself. And God encountered me in that place of desperation. And I discovered joy. I discovered hope. I discovered a love that changed my life forever. And I used to pray this. I used to pray, I want to go around the world. I will sing. I will dance. I will preach about you, Jesus. I just want to tell the world about this love that I experienced. 
But I put one condition to Jesus, just one condition. I said, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want, but please don't let me become a priest uh, for a number of reasons. One, I didn't, I didn't have really have a, a joyful role model of the priesthood. And so I thought uh, there was no one I really wanted to be like. This is the importance of role models as well, you see. Um, and, and, and so that was one. The second thing was I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids. And in fact, I had a girlfriend for four years. And eventually um, this call when start began when I, was, when I was in Italy. I was giving a concert in Italy. And when I was playing this music, this priest walked in. And he was just so incredibly full of joy. He was the first role model I had of the joyful priesthood. Since I've seen a lot and countless of joyful priests. But then I hadn't experienced it. I hadn't encountered it. And I just remember praying in the middle of my concert saying, God, I still don't want to be a priest. But if I'll be anything like this guy, I'll consider it. And that was the craziest prayer I ever prayed. It is the like the moment where God put his foot in the door and I couldn't close the door because it just would not stop this desire to serve people through the priesthood, to love people through the priesthood, through the sacraments. And I had a girlfriend, so it was a bit of a problem. We were dating for a long time and I had to go up to her and say, listen, I think we need to stop this relationship because I'm seriously considering the priesthood. And she cried and I cried and... It, it was a really difficult moment, um, but at the same time, she knew she had to let me go because she couldn't hold me in, and she, know, she knew that she wouldn't be happy if I wasn't happy, in a sense. And then I had to let go as well. And it, it was difficult. We ended the relationship, and I ended up going uh, into the seminary, becoming a priest. And years later, guess what? She finds someone, she's getting married, and she asks me to be the celebrant at her wedding. So <laughs> this is a really, a, a really beautiful, wow. um, beautiful experience as well. So um, I think this is the way God works, that he helps us. You know, sometimes it's really hard to let go of things. But if we let go and trust God, God will not only give us our heart's desire, but he, he outdoes us in generosity. And I think this is the thing that I haven't stopped experiencing since. And I love it. It is an amazing story that you have there about how you discovered God and went on to become a priest, even though you specifically prayed that you didn't want to become a priest, but you ended up doing it. And I remember there was an interview that you gave that you said that if you were given a thousand lifetimes, you know, you probably still become a priest, each and every single one of them. So what inspires you to keep going on uh, in this ministry? Well, look, I, I love the priesthood. I love serving God as the priesthood, in the, uh, as a priest. Um, but I always say this, that first and foremost, it's not the priesthood that's most important to me. It's being a follower of Jesus, a lover of Jesus, and a beloved of Jesus. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. After that, God calls me, yes, to serve him through the ministerial priesthood, which I am so very grateful for. And I love that I get to serve people in this way through sacraments and now online and, and, and to, to be in a sense, someone who inspires people to fall in love with Jesus, to surrender to Jesus. And it's all of our call, but I get to do this in a particular way. And then after that, then I'm a musician and then everything else. Those are just accessories. Those are, are just <laughs> instruments for me to help people come to accept this, um, th th this, the gospel, the good news, which I'm called, uh, ordained to proclaim. And I, when you say when you say all these other accessories, I remember you know one bishop telling me, you know, there's only one priesthood, and there, there are no hyphenated priests. You know, so you, you have titles like psychologist priest, singing uh, musician priest. I mean, we all just priests, and we all and, and and we minister in many different ways. Uh, Father Rob, you know, many people know you are from I mean Melbourne. I mean, at least you you work in Melbourne. And uh, JP JP studied in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> but uh, you you minister in, in, in a smaller parish called Bendigo, I think. Uh, is yes, that, that's the name. Uh, and and what? Tell us a little bit about the parish life there. I mean, we know Melbourne. Where where is where is Bendigo? And and what's okay. the parish life like there? Well, first of all, I work um, the the way I work in a parish. I only work in the parish one or two days a week. So I'm 
um, I, the bishop has appointed me full time as what we call the executive director of our ministry. So we run, a, um, I have staff and we run a, a charity. Um, it's an evangelization charity that it reaches, um, actually the website says 200,000, but over the last few years, it's been actually 2 million people a, a year we've been um, outreaching to um, virtually and in, in person. So I, 2019, for example, I was on the plane 300 times, um, speaking to 1.6 million people. And so I, it's, this is my passion to evangelize, especially to those who are on the outskirts, those who would never have considered Jesus. So I go to schools, clubs, pubs, anywhere that they will, that there's an open door. But I also work in a parish and the parish is about, um, let's say from Melbourne, about an hour and 30 minutes from Melbourne. It's regional Victoria. It's a small town, um, maybe um, 80, 90,000 people. And um, I work in a parish over there one day a week where I celebrate masses, I help. And if the parish priest needs help, I drive over to, to help if he has too many funerals or things going on. Um, so uh, there's, uh, I'm, an, I'm an assistant priest, but it is regional Victoria and Australia is um, 25 or 25% Catholic. Um, so, um, but it, it, even that, that's a very small amount of people that actually um, come to Mass. So we, I think I have, um, in, in my weekly broadcasts, like the broadcast of the Mass, um, we reach more people every week than my entire diocese. Um, so, so the I think that's the case really now with online that. masses is that you know you yeah. get viewership from across the world and I think before coming onto the show you were just sharing about how there are actually followers who are tuning to your mass from Malaysia as well so Malaysia is, is a place that you're probably familiar with or you've actually heard of but you know everybody knows you father as, the, as a singing priest uh, maybe you can actually share with us some of your earliest experiences with music well I started playing music when I was um, 16 or 17 years old. This was after my conversion, after encountering, uh, encountering God's love. Um, I never played the guitar before, so my mom used to play the guitar and I just used to copy her. Um, and then I used to watch MTV and just copy the chords on MTV. And uh, I started playing at Mass and then from there, I started to see the impact that music was happen happen having on the lives of people, you know, people um being impacted like pray being able to pray being able to encounter jesus in a moment of of prayer and a moment of, of ministry and so i continued to play music eventually um i wrote a song for a friend of mine who um, who was sick and died and his parents asked me to record the song and i recorded it put it on a cd and it became malta's best-selling cd malta's wow. best-selling album and so from there, I got a record deal in the United Kingdom, for England, and then from there, I got signed with an American record label, and it just started to grow like that. But then I was in my seminary formation, and I was ready to give it all up. But it was then, actually, my first year that things started to, the opposite, they started to blow up. They, like, so much exposure, so much stuff, and I, I got the, um, a call from, from Pope Benedict's office at the time to sing for for him at a World Youth Day event, and then um, got to sing for Pope Francis, and then, and then it just it just grew bigger and bigger. But you see, for me, music is never the focus. Music is always. I, I was ordained as a priest. Let's not talk about being a Christian because that's most important, as we already said. But I was ordained a priest to minister to people through word and sacrament. Now, the most I think music is it has the power to transcend the mind, to transcend, go beyond uh, our circumstances and go straight to the heart. And so I think music for me is just a beautiful instrument to allow people to encounter the gospel, the, the message of God's love for them. So I speak at schools, for example, I'm in front of 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 students, and I go with a microphone and I'm preaching and I'm teaching, yeah, that's fine. But the minute you pick up the guitar and you start singing, the environment changes. All of a sudden, the kids, some of them crying, you know, people are, are ready to listen. People are ready to take the message because very often people don't remember what you said. 
And this is the same in our conversations. They don't necessarily remember what you say, but they remember what they were feeling and the encounter they had of the transcendent at the moment you were pointing to, to, to the transcendent, pointing to Jesus. And so I think this is one of the most powerful. I'm so grateful to play music. But again, music is great. It's important. And I take this gift that I've been given seriously and I, I invest in it. And I think it's important for me to develop that, that gift that I have and, and to invest in it. But at the same time, it's, 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 it's an instrument to drawing people to the heart of God. Um, the worst title I've ever been given is this, The Singing Priest. Because, <laughs> seriously, because I'm not, I, I'm, I, it, I, it's not a, about fame. It's not about being, it's, it's singing. It's like, it's just about giving people Jesus. I want to be known as someone who's in love with Jesus and shares the love of Jesus. That's, that's important to me. Music, again, is awesome. It's amazing. But it's, I want people to hear my heart that beats uh, out of love for Jesus. And music, they hear the music, no. that's great. Yeah, M music has a way of of breaking barriers, isn't it? I'm sure you you know in your own ministry, you're somehow able to connect with people more than just you know preaching a homily or or, or, or you know telling people, but somehow music is able to to connect the heart to to the heart, uh, and That's people right. are able to to resonate with it. But before we go into a little bit more about your music and your ministry, Father, uh, we all know that you were also a contestant in in X Factor. Uh, what was what was that all about? I mean, how, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, that came about. I think every single year I get an invitation to sing on The Voice, on the X Factor, um, on on all all types of shows. You know, they they ask me all the time, and not because I'm anything good. It's good exposure for them. Imagine having a Catholic priest on the television show. They have a story, my story. They have like it's it's good marketing for them. And they kept asking me year after year, five years in a row. I said, no, I'm not interested. No, which sincerely, I'm not interested because I don't want to be a famous singer. I don't want to be a pop star priest. I don't want any of that. I want to give the gospel to people. But then I spoke to my bishop. I spoke to my spiritual director. And he said, so they said, sort of, why don't you just give this a chance? See how you go. I didn't want to miss an opportunity that maybe God was in. And so I went to the, the actual, the producers flew over to Melbourne from Sydney to speak to me. And we just had a discussion. I said, listen, I don't want to do this show. I told them, I said, but I'm happy to audition just to do an audition and we'll see how we go. And so this was my intention. So to go to audition, maybe one of the judges will say yes. And then two will say no. And then I can go home in peace. Okay. And so I go and I do the audition and all the judges say yes. And they, and they are happy to have me there. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? And so they said, you're going to boot camp. You're going to this. And I kept advancing in the show, hoping and praying that I will get kicked out soon. <laughs> but yet at the same time, giving my best. I wanted to give my best. And so eventually the, um, I, I was praying one morning. I remember this. And as I was praying, um, I just, I felt the Lord telling me, Rob, enough. I think it's time for you to leave. And it was a time when the tabloids started to pick up. You know, I was being written about on tabloid magazines. And, and it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. It was it, it, the nice stuff, but it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't what I was on about. Okay. They were misinterpreting everything. And... I thought, no, look, this, this, is, this is not what I want. I love, I, 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 one, also being a, an introvert. I'm an introvert. So for me, like lockdown, as much as it's horrible, it's, it's good for me because I like quiet. I like, even though I live an extroverted life, it's just, I, I didn't in, wasn't enjoying the attention. But I felt the Lord saying, no, that's it. I think it's about time you stop. And so I went to the judges and I said, hey, guys, thank you so much for this opportunity. But I'm going to leave the show. And they were so upset. They were angry. They stopped the camera, stopped the cameras. And then they said, let's do this again. What? And they came and tried to convince me to stop and to, to, stop, to, to stay on on the show. But I, I did it again. When they rolled the cameras, I stood up and I said, thank you so much for this opportunity. But 
I've decided I'm going to leave the show. And they were upset, but I left. I wasn't, I, I've never regretted it. I'm so grateful for those moments. I'm, I never regretted the audition. I never regretted being on the show. But also at the same time, I never regretted listening to that still small voice. And many people were upset, even including people in the church were upset, saying, you missed this opportunity to evangelize. Others in the church were upset, saying, why are you showing off? It's all about you. You're vain. You're this and you're that. But I knew at my heart of hearts, that's not what I was on about. And so I kept going. But um, yeah, so it was it was a really difficult moment. What it was it was difficult, especially when things started to go really well on the show. And I think sometimes, honestly, if we're not listening to that still small voice, if we're not listening to Jesus, if we're not sensitive to what God wants, the greatest enemy of of what is best for us is that which is good for us. I'll say this quickly. You see, like the greatest enemy of what is best is often not what is bad, but it is what is good. And th so this is why we have to be a people who are able to discern the still small voice of God in our hearts. And not only to discern it, but have the guts, have the courage to obey it. And it is so hard. It is so difficult. But again, God will outdo us with generosity when we're slightly generous with him. He, he showers us with blessing and generosity. So I think I think switching gears from the X Factor experience and talking about that little voice that we we all have, right? We move on to a bit about perhaps the the songwriting part of it because Father Rob, you know, you 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 sing really well, and and at the same time you also compose amazing songs. And you've actually written for like you said a, a couple of popes already, and you've also written the song for the World Youth Day, uh, receive the power. So maybe you can actually share with our viewers as well, how, how, what inspires you and how do you come up with these original songs? Well, I think songwriting, first of all, uh, for those songwriters out there for, or, or any other kind of art, art is, is not a, just a muse, not just an inspiration. There's a lot of discipline that goes into developing an art form. Okay, so like, yes, I can write. I, I'm inspired by a number of things, by my experience. I'm, ex um, I'm inspired by my love of God and the love that others and the struggles that others have in their relationship with God. So I source it that from there. But at the same time, I had to study songwriting. I had to learn songwriting because I, you write one good song, two good songs, but then after the third, fourth, they all sound the same if you don't have the discipline if you don't develop the craft. And so I always say it's like it's 20% inspiration, but 80% muscle. It's 80% of getting there, tying your legs to the chair and writing, writing, writing. Every song you write makes you a better songwriter. And I've, I've recorded maybe 100, 120 songs, but I've written two, three, four thousand songs. And a lot of wow. them are just not just will never see the light of day because they're actually terrible. And some of them are sound like others sometimes. So there's, uh, I'm constantly writing songs. And when I, uh, each song I write, I know makes me a better song writer. And so, yes, it's a discipline. Yes, it's, a, um, it's sometimes really hard work, especially when songs are commissioned. I've written for three World Youth Days. And wow. it are really difficult songs because you have to go through boards and then through, uh, they, they vet songs and then they, check the liturgical aspect of the songs. It is really hard to write for the liturgy. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you do both, Father Rob? Do, do, you, do you write the music and the lyrics too? I do. I write music lyrics. I co-write as well. Um, I do a lot of co-writing and I do that on purpose because I don't, I, I don't want to be surround, um, bound by my own um, inspirations and my own disciplines as well. So... Um, what happens is I get a song and I go to another songwriter and this person tears it to pieces and rewrites and then we tear it to pieces again and rewrite again. And so, and it ends up usually any top 10 songs, any top 10 songs, at least in um, here in Australia, any top 10 songs are co-written songs. 90% of any top 10 are co-written songs. Now there are songs that are written by individuals, yes, but uh, co-written songs 
actually make you allows you to see things that you wouldn't buy yourself. I don't want to get into technical stuff here. Like <laughs> yeah. so coming, right coming, coming moving moving to to a bit more to your ministry that you do. You, you say that you go to schools uh, into different places. You speak to young people. Uh, I, I read that in 2008 you started this program called you co-founded this program called uh, Stronger Youth pa Youth Program with with another bishop. The both of you started this, and you've reached to lots of young people and students. Uh, I'm quite curious to know, in, in your context, like in Australia, when you go and speak to these young people, um, we always have this notion that, that young people are, are not interested in church, are not interested in religion. Uh, and when you speak to them, what, what are young people looking for uh, in terms of, of a spirituality or in terms of a connection with God? What do they look for, uh, for the Rob, in your context? Well... I'd say one thing, it's uh, young people are looking for the exact same thing that you are looking for. They're looking for the exact same thing everyone else. Young person does not look for anything different than an older person. It's just the way they're able to receive it is different. So I think the biggest problem is not that we, um, we don't know what young people want. We do know what they want. They want hope. They want purpose. They want fulfillment. They want joy. They want peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You know, they want all of that. They want that. But the problem is that there's hardly anyone speaking their language, able to give it to them in a way that is authentically palatable, that is authentically consumable. Now, there are many cool TV shows, cool things, cool that, but at the end of the day, there are very few people, preachers, teachers, priests, programs, that have leaders that are ready to become vulnerable, that are ready to be broken and to journey with people, not to preach and to teach them, but to be vulnerable before them. Now, I'm not saying you go and you, you wear your heart on your sleeve, but at the same time, being real about the struggles, being real about what it, there is, and also being able to communicate it in a way that is palatable, consumable, um, like, uh, again, music and the, creating good graphics and, 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 and good engagements and all of that is great. But at the end of the day, if there's no vulnerability, if the person in front, the church in front, the community in front are... Uh, uh, they're giving a package as opposed to being breaking open the bread, becoming vulnerable, becoming broken. If it doesn't, if it if it doesn't cost you your life, then you're wasting not only your time but the time of these young people. So it you used to... you use the word vulnerable several times yeah. in, in that short explanation. What what do you mean uh, to be vulnerable, especially with the young? Well, look, van if if you if you teach religion it costs you nothing if you give people your heart that beats out of love for jesus it will cost you everything because you see love authentic love is vulnerable when you give your heart to your husband your wife you give your heart to someone you love they are the ones that can hurt you most they're the ones you are most vulnerable before they're the ones at the end of the day that know everything that have everything now, this is the thing that we need to have our own encounter with Jesus. Let our heart beat with the heart of Jesus and not tell people about this beat, but literally rip our hearts out. I know I'm speaking figuratively here and hold it to the microphone and let people hear our heart beating for Jesus. Now, how does that work out practically? One, sharing what Jesus has done in our life. Don't tell them only about what the saints experienced, what, what the people around them experienced. But even if you don't have an incredible story, be real, speak, journey with people, listen to people. We become vulnerable when we invest our time, when we strip ourselves of, of our, our comfort and we're journeying with young people, loving young people. And we're hearing his stories and this is vulnerability at the end of the day is giving of ourselves. Jesus took the bread, broke it and gave it. He took his body, broke it and gave it. He didn't, it wasn't something external. And this is what we're in a world, I think, that even youth ministry that performs and graphics and all of this. But, and there are preachers that come and then they sit in a green room and they don't speak to anyone. It's just 
and, pe and priests who go to mass and sit in their sacristy and don't and are not vulnerable with their people you know and this this is the vulnerability i'm talking about it's about being broken and given to young people but uh, you know father uh, and jonathan it's it's not only young people what i'm talking about is absolutely equally relevant to adults uh, teenagers to young adults to the elderly we need to become vulnerable if we're going to give an authentic look at the disciples the apostles jesus there's no greater vulnerability than literally dying on a cross dying for, for the people you love and this is what we're called to do you know father rob i, I like your your sharing about being vulnerable and I think at the same time, part of the appeal of your ministry is that you provide everyone a holding space where they can share their vulnerability, whether it's through storytelling, like what you shared, or it's through songs that you sing and you get everybody to be involved. So I also understand that you actually have a team that you travel with around um, and, and you go to schools like what you share, you go to different places to, to reach out to different parts of the community, different parts of the society. You know, this is something that perhaps in the Catholic Church, in the Catholic Church context, for example, it's not something that we are accustomed to doing. So, I mean, how do you see this as a sharing of um, good news in, in a relevant and meaningful way? And, and how, how is that different from, you know, what we, what we traditionally associate with going for Mass, and, you know, seeing the priest for confession, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, I think we're talking about two different things in a in a sense that one is a mission and the other is maintenance, and you need both. You need mission and maintenance. My vocation, my um, gift, is in mission. I'm an evangelist. That's what I do. That's what I'm passionate about. I don't know if I'll be a very good parish priest, um, because I'm restless in many ways. Um, so God knew what he was doing by sending me out on, on a mission trip. So I think I'm in what I call the marketing department of the church. OK, so I go to schools, kids who couldn't care less about Jesus, let alone about the church. Uh, people who who don't had never have never heard the gospel preached and taught in an authentic way. And so I go into schools, I go into school assemblies, I write music for nightclubs, I do anything, any, and it's not just one thing, it works all together. So if I go to a school and all of a sudden people are impacted, and then if I don't have a social media to follow it up, it's just a hit and run. After my social media, what we do is we create courses, encounter courses they're called, and we go through the entire Catholic education curriculum with the students. So they see my face, my team's face. They see us throughout their entire year after I've visited. Uh, adult formation, teacher formation. So we, it's not just going to schools. There's mission, but also I have a team that specializes in maintenance also throughout the, the, the mission. So it always works together. Now, great, some people do come to the pews. They come to church, many do. But many don't. But what do you do about those that are not coming? Do you abandon them? Do you close the door? Or do you keep feeding them? You keep giving them Jesus. And so this is where our ministry comes in. This is where we give. We just want people to encounter this incredible love of God. And we do it through schools. Yes, I spoke, like I said, the last time I could travel. I still travel a little in between lockdowns. But in 2019, 1.6 million people across the world. I will go to any door that is reasonably opened. I've been all around the world. I've never been to Malaysia and I want to come. I really do. I want to come and visit. Um, but I do. I go India, um, Indonesia. I go America. I go anywhere that a door would open. Because you see, at the end of the day, people need to hear uh, the, the gospel in a way that, that is an encounter as opposed to an education. Both are important, well, but Rob, it's, it's, it's not true that you have not been to Malaysia. Uh, you have been to many, many homes in Malaysia already. You okay. are literally, you're yes. literally in the living room uh, of many, many homes. So, so you are in Malaysia. So you are, yes. you know, you, you are in many different places. Um, to our, to our, to our listeners this morning, if you have any questions that you want to post to, to Father Rob, uh, please put it in the in the comment section, uh, either on YouTube or Facebook. We'll try and get uh, some questions in to, to Father Rob. Uh, Father Rob has got a very busy and a tight schedule, uh, so we'll try and take as many questions as possible uh, this morning to Father Rob. 
Father Rob, just going going back a little bit to, to your vocation story, you know, I, I know we talked a lot about your ministry, but you know, I'm always interested in in that 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 conversion story. Uh, in, in your in your book uh, Breakthrough, uh, you talk about your lifestyle, your reckless lifestyle. You already mentioned it: clubbing, etc., gang, uh, being in a gang, you thought of taking your life. But you do also mention a little bit about a phone call from your grandmother. Uh, oh. That's something that you know. We always say God can work in mysterious ways, and and that seemed to have started your your conversion. Uh, would it be okay for you to tell us a little bit about what that conversation was all about, or was it a, a, a personal conversation between you and your grandmother? Well, I think it was more basic than that. I think it was just so. It was a time where um, I, I was hanging out with uh, violent gangs, and things turned badly, and I ended up having to lock myself in my room. Um, this gang didn't find me. They found my best friend, and basically. They fractured his skull and he ended up in like intensive care. He was dying and these guys were looking for me. So I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. And at that point in my life, I just didn't, I lost all sense of purpose. I didn't want to live anymore. And it was at this moment where I started um, having um, thoughts of ending my life and I started self-harming. And it was, it was a really dark, dark moment in my life. And I gave, I remember telling God, look, I don't want to die, but but I'm, I, if, if something doesn't happen, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know. I, I, I reached out to God, but I didn't really believe that God cared. And it was at this moment I became hypersensitive to what was going on outside because I didn't want to die. I wanted to die for a while to take away the pain, but I didn't want to die forever. And so I... I, at one time, there was this telephone call, and I was overhearing a telephone call, and it was my grandmother. My grandmother called um, to speak to my mother, but my mother took the telephone call outside my room, and I was wondering, why is she standing so close to my room? And it was a conversation. Basically, my grandma was inviting my sister to a youth group, and I, um, and there was no mention of inviting me. And I'm thinking, this. wait, hold on, why isn't she inviting me? <laughs> and so I, I, the telephone call ended and I opened the door. I said, Mom, why didn't she invite me? Um, why, why, why only my sister? And my mother told me, listen, because you wouldn't go. So what's the point of inviting you? But I was so angry. I thought, this is not fair. I said, I want to go to this youth group. I want to go. And but you know what? My mother planned all of this. She knew all of this. This is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> so it was later I found out. So she, this is why she took the phone call out. She knew I would react in this way. And so I anyway, cut a long story short, I go to this youth group. And it was at this youth group I, I discovered community. I discovered not theology, but I discovered people who are were in love with Jesus. And I remember just thinking, I want what they have. I want what they have. To be honest, I was depressed. I was full of anxiety. I hated every person in that room. I just didn't <laughs> want to be anyone anywhere near people, especially people who were happy. But I wanted what they had. I wanted the hope. I wanted the purpose. I wanted the joy that they had. And that's why I kept going to the youth group. And slowly, these young people led me to three things. First, they led me to community. Secondly, that this community carried me, paralyzed as I was, broken as I was. They tore the roof open and carried me to Jesus. They pointed me to Jesus. And once I um, encountered this love of Jesus, the community, and with, through a prayer, as I started to pray, I started to get the professional help and the help from my family that I needed. And so my family um, started um, to be a, and become a support as well to help me out of this place of darkness that I was in. Oh, God! God works in in very strange and mysterious and and wonderful ways, doesn't He? Uh, and He and 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 He planned it with your mother. So, <laughs> I think my my mother and and Jesus were scheming together. They all yeah. <laughs> right, possibly. <laughs> Father Rob, you know the to the topic about about music. I mean, your kind of music. The topic of music is always very contentious in the church. You know, uh, we label we label different kinds of music. We label conservative music, or we conser we say it's very too liberal music. Uh, some some sit in between, and people have different different tastes, different likes for for music. And you yourself said, you know, composing music for liturgy is is, is not an easy task. 
but somehow a lot of young people are also able to to relate with you uh, with your kind of music you know i mean we all go through different phases i mean when you are young i mean at least when i was young you like a lot of faster music but as you grow uh, you know your 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 liking for music becomes maybe softer and becomes probably become a little, a little more calming uh, how, how do you manage this uh, especially within the church i mean some may say your music is 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 too progressive or some some may may not agree that you know the kind of um, music that you do uh, how how do you manage uh, such conversations for the role well i'd say a couple of things the first thing is the is you need to differentiate between music um that is um christian music and music that is liturgical music most of the music 99% of the music i write is not liturgical not even appropriate for the liturgy Okay, so I write music which comes from an experience which is appropriate for while you're driving in the car or while you would like to pray or a time you'd like to reflect in a classroom. Uh, when I write EDM music, the electronic dance music, that definitely is not appropriate for the liturgy. But it is appropriate for a nightclub that all they hear about is sex and drugs and 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 becoming rich when all of a sudden they have this Christian song and they don't even know that's talking about love and the love of God. So there is a time and a space now when it comes to the liturgy and there are songs i write that are good for worship settings like for example a prayer meeting or a youth group but that is different to the liturgy the liturgy think about it like this the liturgy is a big ship and we know that the ship is going to make it to heaven okay so we step onto this ship and and we we're part of this ship now the purpose of music in this ship is like the wind in the sails it's to blow into the sails to make sure not to change the direction of the liturgy not even to draw attention to itself if it draws attention to itself it already defeats the purpose but it is slowly to move to help people focus on what is happening on this ship now there are moments where you get off and you go on a jet ski and you get energized and you get strong and and you come back to to the 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 ship under the guidance of the ship yes and that's times of worship youth groups and things like that but the lit liturgical music is not even about the music it's about the liturgy for example it should be transcendent it shouldn't be pop music in the liturgy because you see it's not about engaging and and being appealing it's about something bigger than you it's something greater than 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 the music than the performance it should like the songs during the offertory for example should all be about what is happening in the offertory the ordinary the gifts the bread the wine are getting prepared to become extraordinary so the song at that moment should be a time where we give our lives the ordinary in our lives that god through his mercy would make them extraordinary so that song should not be about ave maria or it shouldn't be about it should be about the surrendering how are we as a community going to surrender our lives and our hearts to jesus and you see this is there is there are times of engagement there are times of, of for pop music there are times for for um edm there is times for that but the liturgy is not about being progressive it's not it's about we i think balance we have to do is to make people uncomfortable enough to pray but comfortable enough uh, un, let's put it this way uh, uncomfortable enough to grow but comfortable enough to pray if it's going to cause frustration and division among the community then i question and if it's uh, 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 people are unable to pray with it and three people are because they uh, it's their music then i'll question again because it's not about the individuals it's about the community so that's a, there's a lot of discernment involved it's complex that's right yeah. i mean uh, augustine rightly says you know when you when you sing you you pray twice over uh, to that effect you know somehow music is is as i said earlier it it kind of tugs your heart it, it puts you it can put you in an atmosphere of prayer and it can also put you uh, in an atmosphere of 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 distraction or disruption also uh, it can do both uh, very easily uh, sometimes if the if the focus is too much on the music and not on god uh, uh, in, in especially in, in liturgy because then then the whole the whole, as you say the whole idea of worship uh, is kind of like hijacked into just one aspect of the liturgy and sometimes it's it, it kind of focus on one particular aspect of the liturgy and the liturgy is made up of so many different things 
Uh, it's the music, it's, it's the liturgy of the word, it's the liturgy of the Eucharist, it's the community coming together, uh, encountering, uh, encountering God and Christ. Father Rob, uh, just talk a little bit about, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, your kind of, if I may use this word with no disrespect, rebellious lifestyle that you talk about, you know. Um, I'm sure there, there are many people, many parents who struggle, you know, with their children who, who don't go to church. Uh, who are kind of said, you know, uh, I've, I'm done. I'm done with. I'm done with church. Uh, your mother never gave up on you because she schemed with with your grandmother and, of course, with with Jesus. Huh? What would you say to to parents who are who are struggling, you know, to see, especially the children not wanting to go to church? Uh, how how what would you say to them? I and mean, you've had an experience with your own mother and grandmother. Well, I'd say number one is don't underestimate the power of a praying mama and a praying dad if i were jesus i'd be terrified of a praying mom i'd be terrified of a praying dad because moms and dads don't take no for an answer especially if their kids are in danger so pray 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 but also go to a mama who's there fighting for you also to mary goodness we we don't utilize mary enough you know, when I go to um, when I go to Malta, I go and visit my family, and I don't take any appointments. Nothing, nothing. I don't take. Um, I just because I want to just spend time with my family, and I get literally hundreds of people. Father, can you come and speak at this youth group? Can you come and sing at this parish? Can you come and do this? And I say no, 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 because I want to spend time with my family. But Malta's small, and people know who my mother is, and so what do they do? They, they go to my mom and they say, can you ask Father Rob to come and sing at this youth group? Now, my mom is a softie. She, she doesn't know how to say no. So she calls me and she says, Rob, can you please sing at this youth group? Just do it for me, this one. And what do you think I'm going to say? I'm going to say, mom, I don't want to do it, but because you ask me, I'm going to do it. And this is the, I think, this is where Mary, our mother, is so powerful. That we go to Mary and we pray for our children. We are relentless. We are just nonstop just praying for our children. So that's one. Two, also pray for wisdom. Back off. A lot of parents just need to, seriously, just need to back off to pray and to ask for wisdom. It is better to say one thing that Jesus asks us to say that, that is said in wisdom than a million things that are said every single day. So pray, back off and pray for wisdom. Because, you see, your kids love you, your kids respect you, but they don't love and respect being sort of felt that their lack of faith is going to cause them to be less loved or less precious. God loves them as they are. So just one, pray to back off and pray for wisdom. And then once you get that wisdom, once you get the strength, and you, then go forward boldly, go forward in Jesus' name. But don't panic, just back off and pray, pray, and then go forward after you've discerned your move and get people to pray. My mom used to knock at doors and used to get, um, get her cousins and nephews and nieces and everyone was praying for me. I had no chance. I had no chance to stay in my <laughs> rebellious ways. I had too many people fighting for me, praying for me. And again, a praying mama and a praying dad. Goodness. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Scary, but very true about that, Father Rob. I mean, yes. you, you document your struggles. You talk about your story growing up in Malta through the rebellious years and how you eventually had your calling, your vocation, and now, you know, being a priest in Bendigo, Melbourne, and also having a full-time ministry that you run. So all of this, you know, you use the word mission and maintenance, and you, and you use social media as your communication tool to reach out to the mission part of the work and the maintenance part of the work. So, you know, and, and you're very comfortable doing that. So for some of our viewers, uh, even parishes who are tuning into today's program, you know, what would you say that they can actually start with something small in using social media at their parish? Well, I would say when it comes to a parish level is, um, first of all, it's, there's information that is needed. Make sure your, you, you, so your information is current. This is the biggest thing we have in parishes, that it, websites are not updated. Social media is not updated. It's, they go for a while and then stop. So that's one is make sure your information is updated. Two, consistency. And it's not saying every day. 
but at least once a week, post something, anything, the life of the parish. Number three, be real. Stop preaching and telling people what to, to do all the time. Stop, stop only doing inspirational quotes. Be real, do those things, yes. But also be real, show if you're in a social media, the life of the priests, the life of the parishioners, the greeters, introduce people within the community. People don't co connect with the abstract. They connect with you, with me, with the human, with the struggle, with the vulnerability again. So that needs to translate as well. So in my social media, I have where I go live and I talk to people about um, things that are happening in my life. I had a video shoot. I took them behind the scenes. When I go to the gym, I post gym selfies because that's part of who I am. <laughs> when I'm writing a song, I do about it. And people say, yes, you're vain. You're but I think at the end of the day, I want people to connect with all of the brokenness, the humanity, the joys the, of, of the human person. This is what people need. They need the real, they need the vulnerable. And that includes our parishes. That includes what we do in our parish life. I love the way my parish priest does it as well. He just, he, it, it, he's so real. He goes for a walk in the country. He shows there, himself there. And I, I don't know. I just think we need um, some reality and, and some, vulnerability as well in our social media. Talking about social media and, and exposure in that sense, you know, making available to people. I mean, one of the things that probably, Father Rob, you say you have many followers. You're talking about millions. And, and, and sometimes uh, it can also influence the way one thinks in the way one presents oneself. Uh, what I mean is that sometimes, I mean, putting it, putting it bluntly, sometimes it can get to your head, all this fame, uh, this, this popularity uh, of wanting this many number of likes, people following you. Um, as a priest, uh, Father Rob, I'm asking, how do you keep yourself grounded and, and not let all this fame and popularity uh, get to you? What, keep, what keeps you on the right path? Okay. Yes, look, I think there are moments that it does get to you and there are moments where you're going to struggle because um, if there is popularity, um, people look at you. But at the end of the day, I have come to a point where the person on the stage is not the person people really know. Now, I've my whole life, I've struggled with depression and anxiety, with moments where I, where I, I for me now, this has become, in my life, the person on the stage is not the person they know. They, they are, are, yes, they're happy to see me. They want to take a selfie with me. But at the same time, I just, they don't know how human, how broken I actually am. And I'm so aware of it now that I'm almost, I go with a sense of fear, with a sense of fear knowing that this is great. This uh, attention is great. But what I do is I, when someone says, Father Rob, you sang really well. You know, my first thought is always, thank you. I receive that thanks and I receive that. But in my heart, and even out loud, I say, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this gift. And just flip it back to Jesus. Flip it back to him. Give glory to him. But don't let it stop you. Fear of pride. Yes, there will be moments of pride. But get back up again. Get over yourself. You're not going to take any of this with you. Followers come, followers go. Moments on stage come, moments on stage go. But at the end of the day, know your humanity. Know your brokenness. Know, know who you really are. And I think those uh, pride is especially prevalent on those who don't really know their brokenness and their vulnerability. And I think being aware, and this is why like St. Jerome and all the great saints, they used to have a skull, you know, on their, their, their desks. And this is where we need to remind ourselves how finite we are, how broken we are. And so it's, uh, yeah, the, having these moments, but and then at the same time, don't hold back, go. And if it's going to, tell people about Jesus but don't make it all about you don't because and then uh, at the end of the day we want to point to Jesus but yes I mean, there are moments. Would, would you would, would you say that you know it is your it is your your experiences in life it's being early life uh, having experienced that that brokenness uh, within yourself that that keeps you grounded also it reminds you from reminds you of where you have come from because one of the things is that, you know, if you have not experienced mercy, it's very hard to show mercy. If you have not experienced love, it's very hard to show love to someone else. 
exactly. uh, and, and and for you because you have come from from that that experience of of being broken literally being broken uh and and to have this conversion experience and now to understand especially if people are going through similar situations in life that you can show that mercy you can have that empathy towards them otherwise I mean, I always say that. Otherwise, we can always take a higher moral ground on someone else uh, and think that, you know, I'm holier than you, I'm better than you, I, I can do better than you. So I think for a lot of us, it's that, it's that whole, our own experience that, that brings us, well, for me as a priest, that's what brings me to understand what people go through. Because a lot of times we don't understand what people go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can have a sense of it uh, because for the Rob, like both of us, I mean, a priest, in some ways, our, our lives are protected, isn't it? I mean, in, during this pandemic, a lot of people lost their lives. I mean, we, we have job security. So we, it's very hard to say that I understand what you're going through in your family. Exactly. Uh, but to be able to, to at least give a listening ear and, and to, to bring the face of God to people uh, in these times, I think that's what the ministry is all about uh, in, in these moments. Father Rob, uh, you know, I know you have a, you have a, a meeting to go to. Uh, but before you go, we, we have to ask you this, you know, uh, yes. and you know what, what we're going to ask you. JP is all excited and I'm sure our audience. Uh, would you do us a song, uh, Father Rob, before yes. we say goodbye yes. to you? A song to, to, all your, to all your Malaysian and whoever is tuning in from other parts. I know somebody is tuning in from California too. Uh, a, a song to all of us before, before we, we, we take leave uh, from this conversation. Yes, absolutely. And I want to sing this song, um, which is which is another part of my story. Um, and this, I'm just going to try and see, um, which is an another part of my story, which is um, a part where I was that moment where I was locked in my room. And there was this moment where um, I felt lost and confused. Now, my mom used, yes, she was scheming, as I said, you know, she took that telephone call. But it wasn't only that. She used to pray. There were moments she used to knock at the door, she used to cry out, like, are you okay? Because she used to hear me, like, being tormented, like, emotionally. And she'd knock at the door, and I'd just slam the door in her face and just swear at her and just say, get out, leave me alone, you know? And there was, uh, I was writing this book, Breakthrough, and at a point, I, I gave her the chapter. I said, Mom, I was so angry that you used to knock at the door and then just walk off. When deep down, I wanted you to break down that door, you know, to run to me, to hug me and tell me that I was going to be okay. And at a point she cried and she said, she said, Rob, she said, there's something that isn't in your book. She said, there was a, a every time I used to knock at the door and you used to slam the door in, in my face. She said, you, according to your book, used to go to your knees and cry on your bed, just wanting this pain to go away. She said, but what you didn't know was when you slammed that door, I didn't leave. She said, I would fall to my knees outside your room and I would cry. But I, you were crying with desperation. I was crying out of hope because I knew that Jesus, who I experienced, who I encountered, was able to reach your heart and change your life. And so she started with prayer. She'd spend hours and hours just outside my room, just crying and praying. And so I'm just going to walk to my guitar um, and I just want... To, to sing this song which talks ab ab about this, which talks about about the, the prayer of my mom, you know, my mom who, I'll see if I can get a different, um, a different uh, camera, the camera went off, but uh, let's see if you can, you can see my w wider screen here. But this song talks about, um, about turning, uh, about it's called Angel, and it's a song which is the prayer that my mama prayed for me. It's a song which talks about um, her, her, her cry to God for me, her little angel. You are more than I hope for in my heart is overwhelmed by the view of all that you are now and my life is changed forever so I pray that you will be happy that your smile will last forever and God's light 
will shine within you, my little angel. Let him dance over you. Let him sing his song so true. Let his face shine bright on you and lead you to a place called home, home for you, my little angel, for all that may lie ahead now as life serves its joys and sorrows and I pray you will hold on to the love that's never ending so i pray that you will be happy that your smile will last forever and god's light will shine within you my little angel oh, let him dance Let him sing his song so true. Let his face shine bright on you and lead you to a place called home. Oh, for you. So Lord Jesus, I'd like to pray for moms and dads there who are praying for their children. Lord, we pray especially for those who are struggling right now, young and old, struggling with understanding where you are, where they stand even before you. Lord, bring them closer to you, closer to an encounter with you. Let them know, Lord, that you love them so unconditionally that you call them, Lord, to be the saints, the saints that you've created them to be. Give them courage, let them stand up, let them go forward, trusting in you, in your love and mercy. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Father Rob, uh, for for giving us an insight to that song. Uh, you know, the prayer of, of many moms, I believe, uh, during this time for their children, and you kind of encapsulate it uh, with music and and the, the the longings and the desires of of many parents uh, to have their children encounter God. And I think that's that's the most important thing: how they will they will encounter God in many different ways. To, to our listeners, uh, to our audience this morning, uh, this conversation, uh, you can revisit this conversation. It's available, it's recorded, it's available on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, do share it with as many people as possible uh, to, to listen to this conversation. There are, there are many pearls of wisdom that Father Rob shares with us, especially with young people, with, with music, and his own vocation story, uh, which we pray that could also inspire others uh, to seek God uh, in powerful, powerful ways. Father Rob, uh, it's been a, a pleasure and, and, and an honor to, to have had this conversation with you this morning. And uh, thank you for your generosity of time uh, to be able to, to share this with thank us. You, Father Rob. Many people know Father Rob from, from afar uh, on a Sunday or on a Saturday or any other day. Uh, but, but today we got a little bit of an, an, an inside scoop of, of who Father Rob is. Uh, we would like to thank you very much for, for taking time to, to be with us. Uh, despite your very busy Saturday that you have uh, and to share this story with us uh, of your journey, of your ministry. And we pray and we and we pray that God will continue to use you and many more other people who are reaching out through so many different ways uh, to bring the good news of Christ to the world, especially in these challenging and, uh, and times when our lives are disrupted. Any final words for the Rob to our, to our, to our listeners this morning? 
Well, I just say just to understand that no matter what your circumstances, no matter how struggle well, your struggle is right now, your God's love never changes, and God's call over your life to be a saint never changes. Just keep going, keep keep strong, and and fall in love with Jesus. And as a consequence, by necessity, if you are in love with Jesus authentically and truly, it's contagious. Love the love of Jesus is contagious, and others will fall in love too. So, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm I'm really grateful, Father Clarence, and also. Um, John, i uh, just so thankful for this opportunity. So, and uh, one day when this lockdown is over, this pandemic is over, I hope to visit in person um, to come and visit um, Malaysia and, and pray with you and be with you. Thank, Thank you so much, Father Rob. You. Yeah. We, we hope to have you in Malaysia and celebrate Mass together with Father Clarence as well. Uh, two of our favorite priests from our viewers, you know, coming to, together to celebrate Mass. So, thank you so much, Father Rob, for your time. Thank you to all of our viewers and listeners uh, to today's program. That wraps up the 76th episode of Catholics at Home. Like what Father Clarence have actually shared, right after this program, you can actually share it. You can actually re-watch it on either Facebook or YouTube. And we thank you so much, Father Clarence, for your time as well, uh, for being here with us this morning. And to everyone else out there, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you soon at our next Catholics at Home podcast. Bye-bye. Thank you.